Hello, welcome from central London. We're just a stone's throw away from the Houses of Parliament in Westminster. We're here in Central Hall for this Intelligence Square debate on the Catholic Church is a force for good in the world. Well, that's a subject that's going to generate a lot of heat, I think, and um, some light too, I hope. I'm delighted to be chair of this debate. We have a panel which includes some of the most provocative, intelligent, and stimulating commentators and practitioners on the subject. Arguing for the motion, the Archbishop of Abuja in Nigeria, John Onayakin, the British Conservative MP, Anne Widdicombe. Arguing against the motion, the actor, broadcaster, and author, Stephen Fry, and the journalist and commentator, Christopher Hitchens. Well, our first speaker, is John Onayakin, His Grace, the Archbishop of Abuja, the capital of Nigeria. And His Grace is one of Africa's best known, most respected commentators of the church, the Catholic Church. So please make your way to the podium. Speak at the microphone. Friends, um, I, must, I certainly must say I'm grateful to be here because it's, for me it's more than a matter of debate because that's what my life is all about. If I didn't believe that the Catholic Church is a force for good, I would not devote my whole life to pre precisely working in that institution, hoping that I am involved in something that is good for the whole world. You see, for me, to be a Catholic is a gift of God. Let me start with the word church, the Catholic church. Obviously, it means many things to many people, but I think as an archbishop, I should be in the position to say what it does mean, especially to us Catholics. Yes, the Catholic church is, is an institution, and some people say it is perhaps the best organized institution in the world, but that's not really the essence of our church. We should go beyond the institution. And for us, the church is first and foremost a community of believers. And this is a community of believers that is spread all over the world, made up of all kinds of people. And the institution itself, as well as those whom we can normally consider church people, people dressed up like me, for example, we are there only because of that huge community of people who claim who are Catholics. I'm stressing this so that when you are asking yourself, is the Catholic Church a force for good in the world? Don't look at me. Don't look at Benedict XVI. Look at the Catholics all over the world. That the church is a force for good in the world seems obviously to me is quite obvious. The question probably we should ask is, what kind of force? There was once an arrogant dictator who asked in disdain, how many battalions has the Pope? Obviously, he completely missed the point. It's not about military force or physical force, but it is about force. It's about the force of a spiritual message, the force of values, which has stood the test of 2,000 years. And not only 2,000 years in time, but has spread its message all over the world among different, different kinds of people, different races, and we must also not forget the sheer weight of the number of Catholics. I have checked the statistics and we are told that now we have about 1.2 billion Catholics all over the world out of a population of 6.6 .6 billion, 17.3 percent. And these are young, these are made up of all categories of people, young and old, women and men, peasant farmers and high-tech professionals, simple citizens and even heads of states and world leaders. This is the great army that is a great force for good in the world. And whatever they are doing, we consider it as being done largely also as a result of the spirit that guides them. Independent statistics have shown that the Catholic Church is doing far more than its numbers and its population would probably suggest. The action of the church is most significant in communities that are reduced to poverty and misery by human neglect and sometimes by hostile environments. Talking of statistics, 
I spoke recently with the Director General of UNAIDS, which is the United Nations Agency for HIV and AIDS, and he said that 26% of the health institutions in the world directly involved with the treatment of HIV and AIDS are run by the Catholic Church. And please note that it is a well-known policy of our church that whenever we are engaged in social welfare work, it is always given to all without, without any discrimination, whether you believe or not, irrespective of creed. Indeed, it is an integral part of our faith that our church is made up of saints and sinners. We are all struggling towards that perfection which Jesus asked us all to, uh, to first follow. Nor am I denying that the Catholic Church has always and everywhere been do, done excellent things, even sometimes in high levels. But uh, this again only proves that we are in this world. Even the late Pope John Paul II was, had no difficulty at all in admitting the, the mistakes that people who claim to be, church, to be Catholics and working in the name of the church have done in the past. And even apologized. And such gestures of apology is very rare in our world today. Let me conclude by, in, by drawing your attention to one particular aspect of my faith which I admire greatly. My, we are very open to dealing and moving and collaborating with others. And I think this is very important for the world of our days. We are talking of the world of today. We need more and more efforts to link hands across all divides so that we can manage to make our planet a better place. A world of justice and peace. Is there still anybody here who still doubts whether the Catholic Church <laughs> is a force for good in the world? Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Christopher Hitchens. He's arguing against the motion. He is a writer, journalist, and commentator, particularly well known for his um, trenchant and uh, views and very original thinking. So, Christopher Hitchens, let us hear what you have to say. Your time starts now. Please make your way to the podium. I'm sorry to have to begin by disagreeing with His Grace. Um, if you're going to be a serious grown-up person and appear to defend the Catholic Church in public in front of an educated and literate audience, you simply have to start by making a great number of heartfelt apologies and requests for contrition and forgiveness. Now you might ask, you're fully entitled to ask, brothers and sisters, who am I to say that? Well, in the Jubilee millennium year of 2000, the Vatican spokesman Bishop Piero Marini said, explaining a whole sermon of apology given by His Holiness the Pope, given the number of sins we've committed in the course of 20 centuries, reference to them must necessarily be rather summary. Well, I think Bishop Marini had that just about right. I'll have to be summary too. His Holiness on that occasion, it was March the 12th, 2000, if you wish to look it up, begged forgiveness for, among some other things, the Crusades, the Inquisition, the persecution of the Jewish people, injustice towards women, that's half the human race right there, <laughs> and the forced conversion of indigenous peoples, especially in South America, the African slave trade, the admission that Galileo was right, <laughs> um, and for silence during Hitler's final solution or shower. And it doesn't end there. There are smaller but significant, um, equally significant, avowals of a very bad conscience. These have included uh, regret for the rape and the torture of orphans and other children in church-run schools in almost every country on earth, from Ireland to Australia. These are very serious matters, and they're not to be laughed off by references to the occasional work of Catholic Charities, but I draw your attention not just to the apologies, ladies and gentlemen, 
but to the evasive and euphemistic form that they take. Uh, Joseph Ratzinger, the current Pope, considered by some, by Catholics, to be the Vicar of Christ on Earth, in his comment, one of the few he's made on the institutionalization of rape and torture and maltreatment of children in Catholic institutions, he said, it's a very severe crisis which, which involves us, he said, in the following, in the need for applying to these victims the most loving pastoral care. Well, I'm sorry. They've already had that. <laughs> and to say that this is the responsibility laid upon you by the, the horrific admission that you've already had to make is not accepting responsibility in any adult sense. The same euphemism comes in the term some Christians allow themselves to be deceived in this way and to act against the gospel. Well, anti-Semitism was preached as an official doctrine of the church until 1964. Do you think that might have something to do with public opinion in Austria and Bavaria and Poland and Lithuania? There will come a time when the church will issue apologies and explanations and half-baked appeals for forgiveness for things it's still doing. I think that there will be an apology for what happened in Rwanda, the most Catholic country in Africa, where priests and nuns and bishops are on trial for inciting from their pulpits and on the church's radio stations and newspapers the massacre of their brothers and sisters. Staying in Africa, I think it will one day be admitted with shame that it might have been in error to say that AIDS is bad as a disease, very bad, but not quite as bad as condoms are bad, or not as immoral in the same way. I say it, I say it in the presence of His Grace, and I say it to His face, the preachings of His Church are responsible for the death and suffering and misery of millions of his brother and sister Africans. And he should apologize for it. He should show some, some shame. <laughs> for condemning my friend Stephen, Stephen Fry for his nature. For saying, for saying you couldn't be a member of our church. You're born in sin. He's not being condemned for what he does, he's being condemned for what he is. You're a child made in the image of God. Oh no, you're not. You're a faggot. And you can't join your church and you can't go to heaven. This is disgraceful. It's inhuman. It's obscene. And it comes from a clutch of hysterical, sinister virgins who've already betrayed their charge in the children of their own church. For shame. For shame. I don't wish any ill on any fellow primate or mammal of mine, so I'm not, I don't at all look forward to the death of, uh, of Joseph Bratzinger. I don't. Or any other pope. Not really. Um, except for one tiny reason which I ought to confess and share with you. When he dies, there's quite a long interval till the conclave can meet, and for that whole time, that whole interval, it's a delicious, lucid interlude, there isn't anyone on earth who claims to be infallible. Isn't that nice? All I think, all I want to propose in closing is this, that if the human species is to rise to the full height that's demanded by its dignity and by its intelligence, we must all of us move to a state of affairs where that condition is permanent. And I think we should get on with it. Okay, thank you for having me. Well, Christopher, thank you very much for all that. Um, our next speaker is going to have her work cut out because she's speaking in favour of the motion that the Catholic Church is a force for good. The Conservative MP and former Government Minister, Anne Widdicombe, she's as well known for her religious views as for her politics. If you recall, she left the Church of England in 1992 in a blaze of publicity when it allowed the ordination of women priests. The following year she converted to Catholicism and has become one of the most vocal and staunchest defenders of the Catholic Church since then. Anne Widdicombe, the floor is yours. <laughs> If a 
apologies are due tonight, they are due from Christopher Hitchens, who has just run through one of the longest series of misrepresentations of the Catholic Church that I have heard in a long time. He has said, with that certainty which characterises his utterances, that the Catholic Church has had a history of anti-Semitism. Let us just look at the record of the Catholic Church. When the Jewish community was under the most serious threat that it has faced in recent centuries. And just look at the role that the Catholic Church played in the last World War. Mr. Hitchens ignores the thousands of Jews who were secreted and rescued in churches and monasteries throughout Europe. He ignores the 3,000 Jews who in the course of that conflict took refuge in the Pope's own summer palace. And coming nearer to our day, of course Christopher Hitchens is right, and who could possibly dispute with him, that the abuse of children, of innocent children, is one, in fact it is the worst offence that anybody can commit. Of that, no doubt. But again he seems to think that the Catholic Church should have had some unique insight which demonstrably was lacking in society as a whole. Do not expect the Catholic Church somehow, when that was the state uh, of knowledge at the time, uh, to have acted uh, in a unique and completely different way. In retrospect, yes, of course. In retrospect, yup. In retrospect, it should have done. So should the magistrates. So should, so should the Samaritans. So should the National Council of Civil Liberties. But when we ask who, whether the Catholic Church is a force for good, let's just try to imagine a world today without, for example, the billions of pounds that are poured into overseas aid by the Catholic Church, contributing year on year more than any single nation. Imagine the developing world had been left without the input of the medicine and the education that was brought to it by the missions. Imagine the absence of those collections Sunday upon Sunday for famine relief. Imagine the absence of the church in the local community. We play a vital role. And you don't need to be a Catholic to acknowledge that we play that role. What is the church? It is its members. It is the nuns and the monks and the priests and the lay workers and the congregations. It is not just the hierarchy of the church. And I believe that the church to which I belong is a massive, massive force for good. But let us not just keep the debate at that level. I knew somehow that when we were here tonight, we would be discussing child abuse and condoms. They came in the end. I was almost thought we were going to get through an entire speech without condoms from Christopher Hitchens, but we got them at the end. <laughs> but that, that is not what the Catholic Church is about. It isn't only about the physical relief of the poor. It isn't only about the work it does on earth, but it is the message that it preaches. And that message is one of hope. That message is one of salvation. And it is all very well for some people in an intellectual arrogance to say, we can do without that. But actually billions of people across the world live by that message of hope and of salvation. They try to live by the commandments and also by the interpretation of those commandments by Christ. Yeah, 
Sometimes they fail. Sometimes their leaders fail. Human beings do fail. But overwhelmingly, I say to you tonight with no apology or whatever, that a world without the Catholic Church would be poorer, would be more hopeless, and would be a worse place in which to live. Well, thank you very much indeed, Anne Widdicombe. And um, our final speaker is against the motion, Stephen Fry, a bit of an all-rounder, really. Stephen can turn his hand to many things. Stephen, let's hear your views. I genuinely believe that the Catholic Church is not to put it at its mildest, a force for good in the world. And therefore it is important for me to try and marshal my facts as well I can to explain why I think that. But I want first of all to say that I have no quarrel and no argument and I wish to express no contempt for individual devout and pious members of that church. It would be impertinent and wrong of me to express any antagonism towards any individual who wishes to find salvation in whatever form they wish to express it. That to me is sacrosanct as much as any article of faith is sacrosanct to anyone of any church or any faith in the world. It's very important. It's also very important to me as it happens um, that I have my own beliefs. Uh, they are a belief in the Enlightenment, they are a belief um, in the eternal adventure of trying to discover moral truth in the world. And there is nothing, sadly, that the Catholic Church and its hierarchs likes to do more than to attack the Enlightenment. It did so at the time. Reference was made to Galileo and the fact that he was tortured for trying to explain the Copernican theory of the universe. Just imagine in this square mile how many people were burned for reading the Bible in English. And one of the principal burners and torturers of those who tried to read the Bible in English here in London was Thomas More. Now, that's a long time ago, it's not relevant, except that it was only last century that Thomas More was made a saint, and it was only in the year 2000 that the last Pope, the Pole, he, he made Thomas More the patron saint of politicians. This is a man who put people on the rack for daring to own a Bible in English. He tortured them for owning a Bible in their own language. The idea that the Catholic Church exists to disseminate the word of the Lord is nonsense. It is the only owner of the truth for the billions that it likes to boast about. Because those billions are uneducated and poor, as again it likes to boast about. It's perhaps unfair of me as a gay man to moan that this enormous institution, which is the largest and most powerful church on earth, has over a billion, as they like to tell us, members, each one of whom is uh, under uh, strict instructions to believe the dogmas of the church, but may wrestle with them personally, of course. It's, it's hard for me to be told that I'm evil, because I think of myself as someone who is filled with love, who's only purpose in life was to achieve love and who feels love for so much of nature and the world and for everything else we certainly don't need the stigmatization the victimization that leads to the playground bullying when people say you're a disordered morally evil individual that's not nice it isn't nice the kind of Cruelty in Catholic education, the kind of child, let's not call it child abuse, it was child rape. The kind of child rape that went on systematically for so long. Let's imagine that we can overlook this and say it is nothing whatever to do with the structure and nature of the Catholic Church and the twisted, neurotic and hysterical way 
that its leaders are chosen. The celibacy, the nuns, the monks, the priesthood. This is not natural and normal, ladies and gentlemen, in 2009. It really isn't. I have yet to approach one of the subjects dearest to my heart. I've made three documentary films on the subject of AIDS in Africa. My particular love is the country of Uganda. It's one of the countries I love most in the world. Um, there was a period when Uganda had the worst incidence of HIV AIDS in the world. But through an amazing initiative called ABC, abstinence, be faithful, correct use of condoms, those three, I'm not denying that abstinence is a very good way of not getting AIDS. It really is. It works. It, so does being faithful. But so do condoms. And do not deny it. And this Pope, this Pope, not satisfied, not satisfied with saying condoms are against our religion, please consider first abstinence, second being faithful to your partner. He spreads the lie that condoms actually increase the incidence of AIDS. He actually makes sure that aid is conditional on saying no to condoms. I have been to, there's a hospital in Bwindi in the west of Uganda where I do quite a lot of work. It is unbelievable, the pain and suffering you see. Now, yes, yes it is true, abstinence will stop it. It's, it's the strange thing about this church, it is obsessed with sex absolutely obsessed. Now they will say, they will say we with our permissive society and our rude jokes are obsessed. No, we have a healthy attitude. We like it, it's fun, it's jolly, because it's a primary impulse, it can be dangerous and dark and difficult. It's a bit like food in that respect, only even more exciting. The only people who are obsessed with food are anorexics and the morbidly obese. And that, in erotic terms, is the Catholic Church in a nutshell. So, do you know who would be the last person ever to be accepted as a prince of the church? The Galilean carpenter, that Jew. They would kick him out before he tried to cross the threshold. He would be so ill at ease in the church. What would he think? What would he think of St. Peter's? What would he think of the wealth and the power and the self-justification and the wheedling apologies? <laughs> the Pope could decide that all this power, all this wealth, this hierarchy of princes and bishops and archbishops and priests and monks and nuns could be sent out in the world with money and art treasures to put them back in the countries that they once raped and violated, they could give that money away and they could concentrate on the apparent essence of their belief. And then I would stand here and say the Catholic Church may well be a force for good in the world, but until that day, it is not. Thank you. Stephen Fry, thank you very much. So you've heard all our four speakers. It's going to be your turn, the audience, next. And um, I'll give you a couple of minutes to um, think about what you want to um, ask our panellists, any questions or com comments you may wish to make. Because I'm going to give you now the result of that vote that you um, all gave when you were coming in here to uh, Central Hall. The motion is the Catholic Church is a force for good in the world. In favour of the motion were 678. Against the motion that the Catholic Church is a force for good was 1,102. Big difference. However, 346 of you were undecided. So, Archbishop and Anne Widdicombe, you're going to have to not over win over the undecided, but actually convert some from the other side. Let's see if we can uh, sway any opinions here amongst all of you by listening to some 
points that uh, you wish to raise with the panel. And then we're going to ask you to vote again. Now, put your hand up if you want to speak. If you go on, I've got a little button here that will render you inaudible. So please keep your comments to the point. You're standing, sir, so you must be terribly keen and enthusiastic. So I will come to you first. As say your name and designation if you wish to, if you think it may be relevant. Uh, my name is Peter Wood, I'm the Executive Director of the National Security Society. And I've just come back from the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva, where I put to the United Nations Human Rights Council the fact that the Holy See, its alter ego of the Catholic Church, has, been, uh, has broken five articles of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Just one of those, because it's supposed to produce annual reports, and it's 12 years behind in doing those. It did not deny, the, the Holy See came back uh, and did not deny any of the charges that I made uh, on the 22nd of September. Okay. Um, all it said... You're yeah. losing us, you're losing us. What is your point, please? My, my point is, that it did not deny breaking five articles of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child on Child Abuse. And I think it's disgraceful that it should be allowed to do it and that the international community should let it get away with it. Okay, thank you. We'll take another question. Uh, there's a lady here. Um, I would like to ask Mr. Hutchins if he is only against the Catholic Church or against all religions? <laughs> That's you, is this, shall I go to the podium? I'm just going to take one more. Okay. No, just stay here. I think I've um, okay, anybody upstairs? Can I see? I'm sorry, the lights are in my eyes. Hi there. Um, this is a question for Christopher Hitchens. Um, many people today feel that we're really living in some kind of moral crisis, and you can see that all around us. Now, if one thing the Catholic Church does do for good, in my opinion, is give us the Ten Commandments, a very basic, obvious way of giving us some kind of moral guidance. Would you not agree with that? <laughs> okay, well, let's, let's just get a response here from, uh, from our panel. So, Ten Commandments, Christopher Hitchens, that question was directed to you. I don't think the Catholic Church has a monopoly on the Ten Commandments, but nevertheless, <laughs> um, do you... Uh... Oh, is this on? It is on, just stay. Um, am I audible? Yeah. The, the lady in front began by asking me, do I reserve this uh, condemnation only for the Holy Roman Church and not for other Catholics, for example, like Byzantine Catholics and Protestants and so on? I, I think they're all uh, the same equivalent glimpses of the identical untruth. Um, and I might use my answer to just say something about Anne Whittacombe. I knew we wouldn't get through without talk about uh, money being given away on, on supposedly humanitarian projects in the third world. You never don't get that. You never get the admission that it's done to proselytize for religion either, which my friends at Made the Science Sans Frontier, Doctors Without Borders, for example, or Amnesty International don't do. They don't proselytize. They do it for the sake of their fellow creatures. But if I'm debating with a Mormon and I say, are you serious? Joseph Smith got a special revelation on plates of gold in upstate New York, and I ridicule the absurd absurdity of the Church of Latter-day Saints, he's going to say to me, boy, you should see our missionaries in Bolivia, though. It's always the same. Are you going to grant this to Hamas? The whole claim of Hamas and Islamic Jihad in Gaza is they provide social services. Is this claim valid for them, too? What nonsense. No. The proper study of mankind is man, and the proper application of humanitarianism is humanistic, in my judgment. Now, of the commandments, the first, I, haven't, I, don't, I can't list them exactly in order, I have them in my head. The first two or three are entirely about fearing the author of the orders. <laughs> entirely about being terrified of someone who you're enjoined to love. I don't know about you, ladies and gentlemen, but the idea of compulsory love has always struck me as a bit shady, especially <laughs> if... You're, in, you're ordered to love someone who you absolutely must fear. So the first three are, look out for me and keep at least one day of mine where you'll right. be terrified full time. Wait a second. Well, it is Ten Commandments, darling. All right. Yes, I know. But I do want to give the other side a chance to come in. Okay. Have you made your point there? Okay. Anne Whittacombe, Ten Commandments, firm bedrock of moral teaching. Uh, yes, but as uh, Christopher Hitchens took the opportunity to reply to a point I'd made, uh, 
I'm going to take the opportunity to reply to a point that uh, Stephen made, uh, which is very simply this. He says the church is obsessed with sex. No, its critics are obsessed with sex. There's no sex in the creed. There's no sex in the Lord's Prayer. There's no sex in the liturgy. But when the critics start on the Catholic Church, all they can talk about is sex, but of sex more later. Uh, if we can come to the, uh, the Ten Commandments, I would have thought it quite obvious that the Ten Commandments set out a blueprint for a moral and successful society. Let us just look at some of them. Honour thy father and thy mother. Think of today's disrespect. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, and thou shalt not covet. Tell that to the bankers with their bonuses. I actually think that if you look at the moral precepts of the Ten Commandments, they're as relevant now as they were then. Okay. Archbishop, do you want to come in briefly on this? And that point about the rights of the child, I mean, that, that's something that's come up quite a bit. Well, first of all, the... United Nations conventions that he's talking about, uh, they need to be well understood. And it is a fact that there is not a unanimity even in the interpretation of the content and the meaning of many of those conventions is referring to. I am not particularly personally conversant with the issues he is raising, the five accusations that he has laid against uh, the Holy See, but I'm sure that the permanent observer of the Holy See in Geneva would have given adequate answer to his question. As for defense of children, as for the defense of children, taking care of children, I think we don't have to go to the United Nations to learn about that. Oh, by the way, the Ten Commandments are in the Bible but my father knew it before he became a Christian. All African religions recognized those basic norms of morality. Everybody knows that. All right. Let's, let's take some more questions from the floor. Okay. Don't need, don't need the Bible for that. Chat there. Hi. Um, this is a very simple uh, question for Anne Widdicombe. Um, you might think it may be a naive question. If so, I'd be very happy to be educated. Um, why is it wrong for a woman to become a priest, but perfectly acceptable for a woman such as yourself to become an MP? Okay, thanks. We'll come to that in a moment. I think we're going to go... Just, just here next. Yeah. Hello. Um, it's a query, a query for Anne and the Archbishop. Uh, Anne raised a point regarding the billions that are poured into Africa for uh, famine relief, uh, aid and things like that. Um, she also mentioned uh, the billions that are raised in uh, collections. What is, what is the point there? Are you trying to say that the billions that are poured into Africa are raised by collections because we don't seem to see any dissolution of the wealth that is sat in the Vatican and in the palaces of the Vatican, and coupled with that, I respect your faith, I respect the message you give, but why to pass that message on do you need the finery that you wear? Do you need the palace of the Vatican? Okay. Point made. Um, I think we're going to go here. Yeah. Hello. Uh, my name is Matthew Hamden, and I've got a brief question for the Archbishop. Sorry, can you hear me? No. Now we can. Start again. Oh, thank goodness. Uh, Archbishop, of which current Roman Catholic policy are you most ashamed? Which current Catholic policy are you most ashamed of? I'll repeat it. Okay, let's, let's stick with the Archbishop on that. So, Archbishop, which current Catholic policy, this question is, are you most ashamed of? I don't know whether you're serious in that question or you just want to... Uh, provoke because if it all our, our Catholic policies are not just dreamt overnight by the Pope or anybody if it is a Catholic policy it is reasonable it is by, it is based on our traditions and scriptures and there's none about which I'm ashamed if that is the answer to your question okay and the other question about 
I think the Vatican, the Vatican is worth something like, is it two and a half billion dollars it has? And it invests it all over the place and so on. Do you need all that money? Was that question up there, all the finery and all the rest of it? I was trying to listen. I couldn't quite his get... Question, well, his question was, you talked about the billions in aid that goes to Africa, dispensed by, by Catholic organisations one way or another. But what about the wealth of the Vatican itself? Do you need all that money? Uh, if it means that they should carry St. Peter's Basilica to Africa, that will not, that's not the answer. Uh, and I don't know what billions of, uh, that he says the Vatican has. The billions of this world, I think, are not in the Vatican. We know where they are, and they are not coming to Africa. On the contrary, Africa has been sucked dry by those people, those multinationals. They are the ones who should be bringing them, our money back to us. You, I think we are, we are targeting the wrong place. I come from Africa, and uh, the funds that come from church agencies for us are very important. We know that normally in most of those are countries, we don't really, we are not, we don't, we are not, we, we should not even be looking up to people to help us. We should be helping ourselves, and we are working towards that. And would you come one specific question to yeah. you? Why not women priests in the Catholic Church? Well, no, the specific question was, why is it not all right for a woman to be a priest, but it is for a woman to be an MP? That exactly. was the specific question. All right. Uh, and I have to say to you, I mean, that really does betray a vast ignorance. <laughs> a member of parliament, male or female, does not stand in persona Christi at the point of consecration. The church is not about careers. The church is about vocations and about theology. And I do not believe it possible for a woman at the point of consecration, woman's ministry is different. This is specific to the priesthood. and probably won't be understood uh, by a lot of the people who don't understand the theology of the priesthood. Mm. But I don't believe that it is any more possible for a woman to represent Christ at the point of consecration than for a man to be the Virgin Mary. Okay, thanks. Lots of... Very good. Lots of hands up, and I really do want to go around everybody. So, panel, if you could keep your responses to the point as much as you can. Up there, please. Question to Anne and the Archbishop. How can the church possibly sustain and justify taking money from the impoverished in Mexico, in Latin America, in Africa, and at the same time suggesting that you're a force for good? Okay, thanks. Well, uh, question to Stephen Fry. I'm a Catholic, but I, I like you a lot. <laughs> and I, about, I don't know that the Catholic Church condemns homosexuality as such, only recommend chastity for everybody. <laughs> and then, if I am not married, I should be chaste, either I am homosexual or heterosexual. And also, <laughs> as I have read in your books, uh, you should not, or you, not, you don't consider that to be celibate for a long period is something so awful or impossible. That's okay, all right, thank you. Now. Okay, did I say that? Yeah. I missed that first. Hi, uh, question for Anne Whittacombe, actually. You accused Christopher Hitchens of judging the Catholic Church by the standards of the time, but surely the truths in your doctrines are either eternal or they're not. Okay. I'll just take one more there and then we'll come. Yeah, go on. Uh, my, hello? My name is Jeremy Drax. I was baptized Church of England and I'm now in the Church of Rome. Of all the speakers here tonight, I endorse 100% what Stephen Fry has said. In our church, we do not reject anyone. The life of Christ was a life of service, a life of sacrifice, and a life of generosity. He did not spend it with the rich, the powerful, those with nice clothes and refinery. He spent it with the down and outs, the poor, the sick, those who were rejected by society. It is a tragic shame that a church that is founded on such fabulous principles has lost its way in my professional view and personal view in buildings that are arguably excessive to its requirements with cardinals and bishops who 
with Christ's guidance, okay. should be on yeah. the shop floor yeah. serving the people. All right. We've had this. Therefore, why is this church not leading by example and following okay. the life of Christ? All right, thanks. You're reading a statement there. Okay, fine. Uh, Stephen Fry. Stephen Fry, the question about the Catholic Church apparently doesn't condemn homosexuality, that question asked. Uh, well, well, I'm afraid it, it simply does. Um, it, it does condemn it, yes. It, it calls it a, the, the official word is disorder, but it was refined by the current pontiff, Ratzinger, who called it a moral evil. But on the other hand, we must remember, as the point that was made, is that the church is very loose on moral evils because although they try to accuse people like me who believe in empiricism and the enlightenment of somehow what they call moral relativism, as if it's some appalling sin, where what it actually means is thought, um, they, um, they, for example, thought that slavery was perfectly fine. Absolutely okay, and then they didn't. They thought until the year 2000 that a baby went to limbo, causing unbelievable distress to parents whose child died. Okay. Unbelievable distress. And then, with a wave of the hand and a stamp of a seal, it was no longer true. Something that had been eternally, or at least true for 2,000 years, suddenly wasn't. Because the truth is complicated. It's hard. And what is the point of the Catholic Church if it says, oh, well, we couldn't know better because nobody else did? Then what are you for? I think it is high time, I didn't want to get into too much theology tonight, but I think it's high time that this uh, interpretation of limbo by Stephen Fry was questioned. <laughs> now, I actually went to a Catholic school, I absorbed Catholic doctrine, I was certainly taught about limbo, and I don't actually recognise Stephen's description of it. Because it, was, it wasn't for all eternity, what limbo was was simply, and I do appreciate that to most people this won't matter, but it, it just needs answering. What limbo was, was straightforwardly a place where they waited for the second coming. That is all. It's a long wait. Long wait, yeah, long wait. And long Archbishop, wait, maybe, maybe. can you just clarify for us on this thing about homosexuality? <laughs> the Catholic Church condemns the act but not the individual. Did Jesus Christ himself actually say anything about homosexuality? Uh. <laughs> I don't think he did. Uh, that is a wrong question in this regard. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, because no, because uh, the we are not aware about homosexuality, the morality of homosexuality being a matter that drew the attention of Jesus. Uh, but this, Jesus certainly spoke about about the Ten Commandments and adultery. But to come to the position of the Church of, of Homosexuality, we, uh, it, it recognizes there are, some, there are people who have homosexual tendencies and they even consider themselves as such. But we, you are not, it, it, and it, the Church also says that the homosexual acts are wrong, but that doesn't mean that those who are engaged in it are condemned outright because each person has his own personal story. There is room for that. Uh, and uh, I do not think we should deny the church the right to propound its own doctrines. Right. You are not obliged to take let's, it. Let's hear some more from the floor. I'm sorry about the question about eternal truth. We may get to that a little later. Okay, over there, up there. It actually Can't follows on from the point just raised. As a gay man, I find the history of sexual repression and oppression that's gone on in the church to be argued that that's just being um, con being obsessed by sex to be a bit offensive and I wondered if right. Anne Whitcomb would defend her position a little bit more on sexuality. We've had, the, we've had that point. We've, 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 we've dealt with that point. Can I go to number two? Um, I just wanted to say on behalf of myself and my fellow degenerates that uh, I would just like to ask all the Catholics in the room, as well as the uh, proposing team, okay. if they'd like to just stay out of my sex life and in my bedroom. All right. That'd be great. We've had, we've had this, okay. Can we have slightly different points, perhaps, that haven't been, been raised? Yeah. Let's see if I've got any luck with you. Yes. Um, hello. Um, this is a point specifically to the Archbishop. He um, spoke about his father and how, before becoming a Christian, his father had a basic grasp of the Ten Commandments. Uh, from the society that he lived within. Um, he seemed to use this as a point um, to um, prop up his own argument. 
I would argue the contrary. Surely, if people have a grasp of basic morality without the dogma, the doctrine of the church, then everything good, all the humanitarian aid, all the great work that the church has been doing that you've spoken about, surely that's not the church. That's just people that right. happen to be under this umbrella of the church. It's the people okay. that are doing it, not the dogma of the church. Fine. Here. I'm going to take that as a point rather than a, a question. Could, the, the young lady with the spectacles, yeah. Uh, yeah, talking about um, sort of the humanitarian aspect of what's done, I was just wondering if uh, Stephen Fry and Christopher Hitchens felt that perhaps there would still be the same amount of aid and the st same amount of con concern for sort of, uh, you know, people in Africa that do need our help without sort of this emotional, spiritual blackmail <laughs> that perhaps the Catholic Church can be guilty of. Okay, we'll come to that. Any supporters of the Catholic Church? Because so many of you, sorry, I'm not showing bias, but just to spice things up. Gentle, uh, wait till the microphone gets to you. At, yeah, at the front, just not put her hand up. I sit here, I'm, I'm looking at the word intelligence. And I think behind the word intelligence is reason. I thought that this discourse was going to be about intelligence and reason and not about emotion, whipping up emotions. I want to ask Hitchens and uh, Fry. You try to uh, put the blame of the Jewish Holocaust and the slave trade squarely on the shoulders of the church. Are you sure of that position? Okay. Just pass the microphone to the sister next to you, please, because I think you had your hand raised, and then we'll come to the panel. I am a Reverend Sister and a, a nun. I just want to say that uh, our life is based on uh, the life of Jesus Christ, not on uh, emotion or on based on the worldly, the way the world is going. So I thank all the people who are listening and the, I think the message we are getting here will lead us to live a good life. That's why me, myself, sitting here listening to the talk, I think it is good that we focus our attention on the life yeah. lived by our Lord okay. Jesus Christ Thank you. and what our Archbishop All right. trying Thank to you. Thank you, sister. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just take a couple more, actually, because so many hands in the air. Um, can we come... Yep, just take your pick at the front there. Can you keep your points very brief? Because really, you're I taking sh liberties too much, uh, too Anne long. Whittem, Anne Whittingham said there was no sex in the Lord's Prayer. In the Sorry, world I inhabit, no you don't become a father without sex being involved. All right, we'll take that as a point, as a comment. <laughs> if you've got brief comments, OK, there. And then I'm going to come to the panel, don't worry. As is so often the case in these debates, uh, the devil lies in the interpretation of single words in the motion and word is good and it is I think one has to accept that if you have a billion followers then it is an enormous force but whether it's exercising its good now uh, or it should change Stephen Fry left the door open to us to see that right. if the Curia and the Pope uh, uh, admit that there needs to be change, okay. then think we would, I think, vote okay. more favorably for the church. Okay, thanks. Let's just get through some more comments. Okay, yeah, briefly, please, briefly. Thank you. Uh, as somebody who spent 38 years of her life as a Catholic and then start saw the again, light. Start again, start again. Sorry, no, no. we didn't hear. I spent 38 years of my life as a Catholic and then I saw the light. And um, my life now is going back and forth to Africa and next month I go to Uganda and I'm working on trying to stop mothers dying in pregnancy and childbirth. What I'm saying is, please, please, reverse the rule on condoms and family planning and contraception and right. save more lives. <laughs> save thousands and thousands of lives. We're running out of time. We'll do one briefly. No, we will. All of you. Because they need... Uh, uh, OK, where is the microphone? Three minutes. Microphones. Yeah. OK, just... Let's keep this moving. Briefly, please. 
Yes, very briefly, um, as a Catholic, I'm actually very pleased to be here this evening to hear two sides of a very important argument. And the positive thing I take away is that the Catholic Church can take the opportunity to reflect upon these comments and that we look for the future. And it's by actually accepting these comments and by looking for a way forward that the church can actually grow and have a more important part of the world. All right. Thank you. Up there. You can actually press some of these points in your closing statement. Hello, this is a question for Stephen and Christopher. I'm really happy that Stephen's mentioned the Enlightenment and empiricism, which is something that I, I, uh, I think can add a lot to, to human existence. And I'm just wondering um, what your thoughts on the the monopoly of a certain type of, of sensation that religion seems to have on the, you know, the existence of God is obviously put down to a particular sensationary experience and also the, the further impingement that religion is having upon empiricism in particularly um, the United States on things like you know, intelligent design okay. and these arguments. Thank yep, you. Yeah, briefly. Okay, very, very quickly, like 15 seconds everybody. Yeah. Where is the microphone? Just take it there, you don't have to stand in the middle. Um, just a question for the Archbishop. I'd like to know how, how you calculate the figure of how many people, how many Catholics there are in the world. I was baptised a Catholic. I'm now atheist. I, I, am, I presume it's done by baptism records, and I'm cal calculated as a Catholic. Okay. And why can I not now disassociate myself from the church? All right. I'm sorry, everybody. Can't really take any more questions. Can't take any more questions from the panel. What I propose is this. You've heard the points that are raised. Some of them are comments, some of them are questions. You're going to have a few minutes to make your closing statements. Please incorporate these questions that you heard in your closing statements. Because audience, I want you to vote again. Now, for those of you who are watching at home, if you'd like a briefing booklet on some of those issues that you've heard raised today, then please go to um, www.intelligencesquared.com and you can download that booklet. Anybody can do it and it's absolutely uh, free. Okay, so everybody is doing that. So while you're all doing that, it's going to take a little bit of time. We're going to hear the closing statements incorporating some of the points that you, the audience, raised. And we're going to do it in reverse order this time. And it's, um, it's going to be Stephen Fry first. Um, well, it's been a really interesting debate. And I, I, I love, I've loved some of the questions from the floor. Um, I suppose I'm slightly disappointed that... Uh, and Whittingham in particular should say, oh, I knew they'd bring up condoms and child rape and yeah. homosexuality. It's a bit like a burglar in court, so you would bring up that burglary and that manslaughter. You never mention the fact I'd give my father a birthday present. You know, it's, yes, yes, are you getting the message? There is a reason we hammer home these issues, because they matter. There's such an opportunity, owning a billion souls at baptism. It's such an opportunity to do something remarkable to make this planet better. And it's an opportunity that is constantly and arrogantly being avoided. And I'm sorry for that. Okay, thank you. Final statement from Conservative MP Anne Widdicombe for the motion that the Catholic Church is a force for good in the world. Right, we have had all the usual stuff about how uh, the Catholic Church uh, being against condoms has apparently caused untold misery. As I've said, our opponents always try to home in on sex when the teachings of the Church, which are after all only about the stability of family, the maintenance of fidelity, the virtue of chastity, when the Church teaches that, as one part of all its teaching, I do sometimes despair at the way that these debates always, always come back to that. So I'm very pleased to have been here tonight, despite the fact that I think the incoming poll was slightly discouraging. Uh, I'm very pleased to have been here, to have been here with the Archbishop and with the two gentlemen opposite, and thank you for the opportunity. Okay. Against the motion, Mr. Hitchin. Unanswered questions. Amazing. No one, though they were asked repeatedly, would say whether they thought Stephen Fry, my friend, was in a state of mortal sin or not. They wouldn't tell you. Something about the question, 
brought out their inner coward. Well, I say that homosexuality is not just a form of sex, it's a form of love, and it deserves our respect for that reason. That if, if when, I, when my children were young, I'd have been proud to have Stephen as their babysitter, and I'd told them they were lucky. And if anyone came to my door as a babysitter wearing holy orders, I'd call first a cab and then the police. <laughs> Final statement from our final speaker, Archbishop of Abuja, John Onayakin. You've got to make your final pitch now to the audience. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to draw the attention of the audience back to the topic. Yeah. And the topic is quite clear. The Catholic Church is a force for good in the world. It did not say it is the only source for good. It did not say it has always been a source for good. It's not in the past tense, it's in the present tense. It is a source for good. I, can, I still have not seen how they have in any way shown that the Catholic Church is not a force for good in the world. I can say all kinds of things about other people, but I think it is fair enough that um, when it comes to what does the church say about condoms, what does it say about homosexuality, what does we say about women priests, is, we need to take the trouble to find, find out exactly what it is saying, not what the, the newspapers are saying that we are saying. Uh, we never said that the Catholic Church is perfect. We continue to do our best to be as close as we can to Jesus Christ and his, what he wants us to be, and to constantly be a force for good in the world. And I thank you. Archbishop, thank you. Audience, you've all voted again. Now the moment of truth panel. Let me remind everybody that before the debate, when everybody came in, this is how you voted. For the motion that the Catholic Church is a force for good in the world, 678. Against the motion, 1,102. And the undecided, the don't knows, were 346. This is how you voted subsequently. For the motion that the Catholic Church is a force for good, from 678, it's gone to 268. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Against the motion, it's now 1,876. And you can see that doesn't leave very many don't knows. It's 34 undecided. So, commiserations, Archbishop and Anne Widdicombe. Congratulations, Stephen Fry and Christopher Hitchens. Thank you all. From me, Zain Abidari, goodbye.